thank you all for being here. Um, this is yeah already a tradition, part of the, the Ruby Collective uh, Science Chats we do every Monday or now like each two Mondays or three Mondays per month. We have been doing this since uh, July last year because of COVID and it turned into a really interesting format of discussing ideas from everything related to river conservation, but somehow it got broader to many other topics like science communication, um, lots of uh, talks about activism, and in this case, we are going to talk about queer calling. Uh, today with us, we have uh, Nicole Seymour. She is an environmental humanist and also a queer ecologist. For those of you who don't know what that is, this is will this chat will try to shed some light into that. She's working now on glitter, like she says. We had a nice interview about that some uh, days ago, and she already published two books. One is called Tra Strange Natures, and the other is called uh, Bad em Environmentalism. Um, and now Nicole is gonna give us a brief uh, talk about what queer call you like, a kind of an introduction. And uh, after that, we may discuss, we will have uh, an answer, uh, a questions and answer session, and then we may just talk uh, until nine. I think at nine, we will kind of close the session. So thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, it's uh, the stage is all yours, Nicole. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I have to say that um, when I say I'm a queer ecologist, it doesn't mean I know things about science. So just keep that, keep that in mind. But the term queer ecologist and queer ecologies will hopefully become clear in just a moment. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen, but just holler or write in the chat if, you, if there's a problem, if you don't see it or something. But should work okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay, um, so yeah, so I'm at the Rachel Carson Center in, in Munich right now, but um, only until Sunday. Um, <laughs> and I've been working on a project about glitter, as was just mentioned, and um, that doesn't make a huge appearance in this little lightning talk, but um, I'm happy to talk about glitter afterwards. So, um, so when we say queer ecologies, we are using the term queer to mean non-normative or deviant or strange. Uh, by some measure, um, sometimes more uh, specifically in the sense of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, etc. Um, and when we refer to queer ecologies as a field or subfield rather, um, we're talking about a conceptual framework that emerged primarily in Canada and the US in the mid 1990s that considers how sexual, gender and environmental issues intersect. So in various areas, so cultural representations, scientific research, and other realms. And I'll give you a couple examples of that in just a second. Um, so the, the big claims, the big moves of queer ecologies is to say things like human norms such as heterosexuality and heteronormativity more specifically influence our appraisal of the natural world and vice versa. So heteronormative, it's a bit jargony, but um, just refers to this idea that heterosexuality is um, not just natural and, and common, but um, um, well, it's the norm, right? But, <laughs> but it's sort of the assumption that everyone and everything from humans to non-humans are somehow straight in some way. Um, and so uh, the other sort of big claim of, of queer ecologies is that the category of the queer and the category of the natural have been opposed in cultural, scientific, and political discourses, but actually have much in common. So oppression, exploitation, biopolitical control, surveillance. Um, and just to give a, a quick um, explanation of this, this second one, I'm, I'm sure it sounds familiar to people, but just in case. Um, so in the United States, um, when there was debates around same-sex marriage and George W. Bush was president, he gave a speech um, uh, for the Defense of Marriage Act, in which he said we cannot rip marriage from its natural roots in heterosexuality. So he was using these um, very, you know, natural metaphors um, and, and implicitly sort of linking queerness with the unnatural and heterosexuality with the natural. And so Queer Ecologist is trying to say, even despite this long history of doing things like that, um, we have to think of the queer and the natural together because of the ways in which they've been oppressed. Okay, um, other big claims, binaries such as culture slash nature, uh, 
constructed slash natural, human slash non-human, male slash female, reason slash eroticism, straight slash gay, normal slash abnormal, self slash other, and life slash non-life are not only mutually reinforcing, but generally harmful. Um, and I'll, I'll give some more examples in a moment about, um, you know, the, the self and the other and the human and non-human being being connected. Um, so the last big claim I want to mention is um, the idea that patriarchy, heteronormativity, reproductive futurism, and white supremacy inform cultures of fossil fuel consumption, and that we cannot move beyond the latter without dismantling the former. So gender and sexuality actually have a lot to do <laughs> with things like uh, big oil, this sense of, you know, um, you know, the planet is ours, we can plunder it, we can do what we want with it because we, we need more, more, better, faster, etc. So those being patriarchal mindsets. Okay, so um, that was just sort of uh, an outline with not a lot of examples, and now we get examples with fun pictures. So queer ecology scholars might do things like recover evidence of homosexuality and transsexuality in animals, uh, that mainstream science has downplayed due to heteronormative biases. And um, Bruce Bagamill is, is um, a person who has written a lot about this and written about um, the ways in which scientists, when they do see evidence of um, homosexuality, homosexuality or transsexuality, they kind of, you know, fall all over themselves to try to find some alternate explanation. So, um, you know, oh, there must have not been any females around. That's why the, the males are... are um, you know, fraternizing or, or, or hooking up or whatever. Um, so this picture is a parrotfish and the parrotfish, or a stoplight parrotfish specifically, and they are um, transsexual. So they, they change from um, male to female. Um, queer ecology scholars might also show how and why queer literature, media, film, and performance convey environmentalist values. And this is something I've written about a lot and um, the picture is of a drag queen named Nuclea Waste from New Mexico. And this is just a recent um, thing that was on her, her Facebook page, wear a mask, don't be a drag. Um, and she sort of, um, she dresses up in really like 1950s um, clothes, like she has this beehive hairdo and this, um, this kind of, um, you know, Marilyn Monroe type dress. And so she's sort of, um, mobilizing these, you know, remnants in the 1950s to sort of echo, um, um, you know, the, all the nuclear testing that was going on, especially in the U.S., um, and trying to sort of, um, in a camp way, draw attention to um, environmental pollution. Um, queer ecology scholars might also catalog the ways that human genders and sexualities depend on animal consumption. An example of this is um, the use of um, pregnant horses, pregnant mares, urine in menopause treatments. Also, um, the person that writes about this, Eva Hayward, um, is a transgender woman and also talks about um, animal products being used um, in um, her um, hormone regimen for um, sex changing, right? So in this way, sort of thinking about um, humans and non-humans being dependent, specifically human transsexuality um, requiring um, animal life. Um, and I think this is my last example. Um, queer ecology scholars might also investigate the ways that plastics hormone disrupt disrupting capacities are querying our reproductive system. So there's a lot of research about um, endocrine disruption and sort of um, the feminization of, of male um, species, including humans in particular. Uh, but queer ecologists like Heather Davis um, say this is not a reason to panic, right? This is not a reason to sort of trot out homophobic or transphobic rhetoric, it's maybe an opportunity to sort of think about uh, the plasticity, as it were, of gender, the flexibility of gender. Um, oh wait, I had one more example here. Um, and this is sort of, um, we can debate this one because I think it's one of the more controversial kind of um, moves, but queer ecology scholars might claim that life itself is queer insofar as evolution, continuation of life, uh, depends on deviations from the norm. So life is queer insofar as it requires uh, deviation to continue. Um, and these are just some, some books I recommend. I may have written the one on the left. Um, there's also a collection called Queering the Non Slash Human by Noreen Giffney and uh, Myra Hurd. Uh, Mel Chen has a book called Animacies, Biopolitics, Racial Matter and Queer Affect. 
And then on the right is the Bruce Bagamill um, book that I mentioned about the, the, the gay birds and the gay uh, trans fish and all that good stuff. And that is a bibliography and I'm happy to um, send that to anyone. I can take a screenshot of it. And yeah, that was a real lightning round. I don't know, it's, it's all over, it's all over. <laughs> Yeah, so we will have now time to to discuss this very new concept i i believe for many of us here right um if i may i i would love to to open the the, the discussion and also invite you uh, who who wants uh, of course to to turn your uh, cameras on because, or you don't have to turn your mix but so at least we see each other's faces um Nicole, we were talking last time about a uh, glitter, uh, you remember, right? And uh, you also had a very interesting argumentation about uh, how this was also a very interesting point, uh, uh, focus for uh, queer ecology. I mean, if I tell you glitter may be interesting for people uh, studying plastic pollution or stuff, but how is glitter related to all of this? Um, yeah, lots of different uh, directions to go there, but um, one thing I'm interested in is how, well, so there was, I start my book off by talking about how, I think about three, it's like three and a half years ago, there was this big, I call it the great glitter backlash. I don't know if it made its way to where you all are, but um, in the US and the UK, there was all these articles about how glitter is a microplastic and it should be banned and it's ruining, you know, ruining the oceans, it's ruining the world. Um, and I thought this was very interesting because I thought it was a sort of, um, well, it was a very random thing to pick because I think like hamburgers are definitely <laughs> worse than glitter. And in fact, there's you know, all these statistics that show glitter has like a very tiny, um, tiny impact. Um, and most microplastics are actually coming from um, mac macroplastics, right? Coming from, um, um, this is actually wool. I don't know why I'm touching this. Um, coming from, what's it called? Those fleece, fleece jackets you get from like North Face or whatever. So every time you you wash one of them, the little um, fibers um, don't get caught by the, the drainage system, they go out into the ocean and yada yada. Anyway, so, so the, one of the arguments there is that glitter has become this kind of scapegoat um, for like environmental shame and that it's kind of being, um, it's kind of connecting to those rhetorics I was talking about before, right? Queerness is unnatural, queerness is toxic, queerness is bad. Um, and also sort of connecting to this thing I write about in um, my more recent work, which is um, environmentalists tend to like always be finger wagging and like depressing everyone. And so it's just like, even this thing that we think of as like harmless and fun, there's a dark side to it, right? That, that clickbait move of like, you think glitter is, um, you know, something delightful and harmless and then it turns out it's evil and yada yada. Um, so anyway, just sorry, I'm rambling. But um, so what I'm interested in now is um, there's a lot of eco glitter brands that are um, using like cellulose and um, you know th that are either low plastic or, or no plastic, and those brands are specifically marketing themselves to um, LGBTQ plus communities and um, kind of doing that queer ecologies thing, right? Of bringing the queer and the natural back together rather than trying to to separate them. So yeah, that's the glitter thing. Feel free to ask any question, um, or else I will keep uh, talking because I, I we already I already have like two or three more questions, but I want others to to also ask something if they want, or else I go. Like. For now, I'm really enjoying the, the stories, <laughs> so go ahead, Jens. <laughs> So I think um, uh, one interesting point in queer ecology maybe, and, and also that maybe a point to, for further discussions is also like all these binarisms that we have in natural science, right? Like male, female, living, non-living, and uh, human, non-human, and so on. So I, from that from that perspective, Nicole, how how can actually how is a queer ecology? actually ecology like how much of ecology is in uh, this uh, subfield right because from my readings i've seen it's so much about like uh, theoretical knowledge about how we are knowledge but it's not about like sometimes it lacks for me certain exam uh, examples of species and actually other beings non-human beings so from that from th that point on how would you discuss that um that part 
Yeah, so I'm going to drop a, a, a book in the chat that I should have mentioned and I just forgot, but it's um, a book that came out, I think, like 15, 20 years ago, and then it's been updated. Um, and it's called um, Evolution's Rainbow by Joan Roughgarden, who's an um, evolutionary biologist. So um, yeah, you're right, kind of, you know, going back to my joke at the beginning, when we talk about like being, <laughs> we're talking about being a query ecologist, like I you know, haven't taken biology since high school, but um, but there are people that, that are real scientists and, and do write about these, these topics, Bruce Bagnell obviously being the other example. Um, but yeah, so, so Query Ecologies does sort of span the humanities and the sciences and you can find, I mean, people like Karen Barad, who's um, may or may not have heard of, um, who's a, a physicist, does um, some Query Ecology stuff, um, but you can also find this stuff happening in English departments or, or history departments. But um, like, I'm, I'm just trying to think of an example that um, for some reason you reminded me of this, but um, so think, yeah, think about these binaries of, of human, non-human and, and self and other. And one that, that really jumps to mind is sort of like the hot topic of, of microbes now. I think everyone's like, it's just like, that's it's like the, the buzzword of the, the Rachel Carson Center. I hear it like 25 times a day, but um, um, this realization that, you know, that we have like, creatures living on our skin and living in our stomachs you know it's not it's not news to scientists but it's news to the sort of general public and of course we're still learning things scientists are still learning things about about those creatures but um so a lot of um feminist science science scholars um so not scientists but people like um Stacey Alimo have sort of taken a feminist look at this and and have said you know the the sort of um the the classic image of um you know the ideal human is that they they are in control they are uh, sovereign they are individualistic they are um you know self-contained literally and figuratively so and this figure is usually a man right so stacy alimo writes about how women have not been considered <laughs> the ideal human because they you know have leaky bodies and they you know like they give birth and other sort of horrifying disgusting things um, obviously joking, but um, so anyway, so the, so this sort of awareness of microbes challenges this idea of the ideal human as being um, self-contained, individualistic, sovereign, in control, etc. So right, once we learn that, like, if we're not eating like the right kind of yogurt, we, that's maybe why we're like depressed, right? This like incredible idea that other beings could be controlling our um, our um, our bodies in, in various ways is. Um, it's sort of a feminist realization or queer ecologists have taken it in sort of a feminist and queer uh, direction, so. Just uh, stepping up on what you said uh, about like all these, um, well, to, for the like broader audience, uh, these new uh, ideas about uh, symbiosis, like this bacteria uh, and human relationship. It's very interesting because I just had an interview to a virus expert and we, well, I, I bet most of you know about um, this uh, relationship between bacteria and the, the eukaryotic cells and how bacteria, like archaic bacteria, are supposed to be like, or nowadays, mitochondria in our animal bodies mm -hmm. and the, the chloroplasts in like the plants. So that's an endosymbiotic, endosymbiotic relationship. And mm -hmm. um, well, Lynn Margulis studied that and there's he this friend of mine told me that there's even uh, another um, theory about the endosymbiotic relationship between viruses and eukaryotic cells and that actually the cell nucleus of the eukaryotic cells evolved from a large dna virus so not only bacteria but also viruses are are in our body mechanism like cell mechanisms so that's also another example of how intertangled we are in this strange uh, relationships. From that, uh, Cara, go. Oh, sorry. I have a, a question that's going to change the topic. So if you want to continue, please go. No, no, just change it. Okay. Um, Nicole, how much do you think that this research in queer ecology has actually had an impact on the movement or even... Is there a movement of more queer and LGBTQ folks joining science or being open in the field of science? Because I know that's actually like science and hard science and STEM and all these um, sort of kind of definitely has its glass doors. So do you feel like this has had an impact or do you feel like you're in a bubble? Is that, that might also be another question. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I just know from the US that, that STEM is still, you know, extremely male dominated and there's these kind of, um, you know, like groups like queers in science or whatever, but um, yeah, I wonder, yeah, well, well, this is interesting because it's sort of getting us to, um, I can talk about kind of one of the dangers of queer ecologies and, and I promise it'll sort of loop back to your question, but um, I'm also just sort of like, you know, trying to avoid your question because I don't know the answer, just kidding. Um, but um, so one of the, the sort of critiques of queer ecologies is that it becomes this kind of um, uh, instrumentalist, um, it, it becomes normative on its own where we get to say like, oh look, there are gay people, gay people, <laughs> there are gay creatures in nature, therefore, you know, it's okay to be gay, right? So that, that we sort of like appeal to the natural world to justify uh, LGBTQ plus existence. And there's a lot of problems with that. I mean, one is obviously that, um, you know, it's it's extrapolating from <laughs> like what like across species in ways that that's problematic, and it also sort of um, sets up this precedent of, you know, well, if you can't prove that you were born gay, right? Like maybe like we don't find the gay gene or something, then like are you legitimate? Right? So I think I think these appeals to to nature are like sort of questionable, and so I guess. Um, getting back to your question, um, I mean, on the one hand, I, I kind of want to say like, yeah, maybe the more you find these examples of queerness in nature, that sort of, again, it justifies the existence of like humans who are queer, but then I also, like, that makes me feel icky, like, to, to do that sort of, you know, again, what if there's a, a behavior, maybe it's not homosexuality or transsexuality, but what if there's a behavior that we can't find out in nature? does that mean it's no longer good or okay, right? Then, then you're sort of back in the same George W. Bush boat where you're like, you know, only things in nature are okay. And if I can't find them in nature, then they must be bad. So um, yeah, that wasn't an answer to your question, <laughs> but it's a good one. No, it, it sort of is because it's you're definitely highlighting like the, how problematic it actually can be to, I, and I get that, I, but I only just sort of realized that through your, through your comment. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions or comments? We had two people join just now. Yeah, Sabrina? Yeah, I would like to refer to uh, activism and and I think that because if, if you take a closer look uh, either on, on feminism or, or gender theory or uh, on environmentalism and even if you if you link it you always have these not not uh, only these binary views but also yeah one usually is an inferior to the other and uh, if you then try to strengthen one of them then uh, we have these biases that try to put you in the uh, corner of the weirdos and uh, the yeah ecos or whatever and i think that uh, probably we could learn a lot if we look at, uh, uh, closer into strategies of queer activism as well as environmental activism and probably link both uh, closer to each other and i wonder if you uh, yeah, have some thoughts about it or even more insights. Yeah, so that's, um, you know, again, I sort of, I write it, I, I sort of introduce queer ecologies as a, a fairly like academic framework, but um, there's a lot of groups that are doing that work, maybe without, not, without using that, that term. So in the US, there's a group called um, Out for Sustainability. Um, and I think it's written like, out and then the letter for sustainability. Um, and there was another, um, I guess it was sort of like a, 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 a subgroup of the People's Climate March, which um, was also in the US, but I think starting in 2014, I think there was other um, uh, offshoots other places, but um, there's a group called Queers for the Climate. Um, and both of them, I think, um, well, just backing up a second, I think what's really interesting is that um, environmentalism has always been part of queer activism, but it sort of like wasn't highlighted or, or people didn't recognize it. So um, I always use the example of the, the pride flag that has all the, the colors. It was um, invented by, um, I think his name is Gil Baker. And each stripe of the rainbow was supposed to represent something. So I think pink is for like 
sexual desire or something like that. And green is for nature. So that's, you know, I mean, that's only the 1970s, but still like, you know, <laughs> 40, 50 years of um, queer activism, we could say had, you know, an environmental consciousness. And then um, only recently do you have these groups that are getting very um, explicit about it. And there's um, the Out for Sustainability group has a, a um, campaign called Plastic Free Pride. Um, and it's sort of training its eye on how like uh, pride movements have gotten very like commercial, you know, like everyone goes to pride, at least like in California, you know, like everyone and their mom like, goes to pride and then you get like the free, like Budweiser is like throwing out the free like beer koozies, like those like foam things that help keep your beer cold and uh, throwing out Mardi Gras beads, which are like those plastic um, like carnival beads and um, that it's become not just like a very commercial and mainstream event, but like a huge like producer of trash, like a huge pollutant and sort of like calling calling us back to like our, our roots of, um, you know, activism that was intersectional and that, that cared about the environment or thought about the environment. So um, yeah, so there, there's, there's folks that are working on that. And then um, there's also um, an, an artist um, or a singer named, um, Anoni, who is um, a transgender singer, and she actually, um, she was nominated for an Oscar, um, an Academy Film Award for, um, she did a song for a climate change documentary, and now I can't remember the, <laughs> the name of the climate change documentary, but she has um, a bunch of songs about climate change. And so there's, yeah, so you can kind of see like queer ecological activism, like in, in all sorts of different um, places. So yeah, thanks, that's a good question. Any other question? Anybody that's inspired by this or has any 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 comment also uh, or reflection that pops up out of this conversation? I can also do it all over again for the people. That <laughs> 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 <It's very short>. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I was going to ask you have. Oh, sorry, Anna. Uh, yeah, so I have more of like a comment or discussion thing that that was actually that I was kind of challenged by recently. So one of the things you mentioned is that um, like this challenging this binaries of human non-human. Mm -hmm. And um, recently I've been discussing quite a bit with some people who are in the anti-species movement, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know how much that relates to what you've been talking about, but I think it does a bit. Um, and so for me, it's very kind of clear that I think nature shouldn't be a criteria for what is good or what is not good, right? Because I think there are many others. Um, but then one of the criteria that is like proposed in the anti-species movement is um, suffering or like minimizing suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and so that we should, instead of like um, taking what is natural as good, we should try to minimize suffering mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. among all different species and so on and then if you take that argument to the extreme um it would even this kind of criteria for what is good would even support to like totally modify natural ecosystems in order to exclude as much as possible suffering like from predation and stuff like that and for me that's like it's a rational argument that I can follow, but as an ecologist, I feel very horrible about the idea of interfering in nature. Um, and then also, for instance, um, there's, you know, we, we in, in ecology, we like to categorize things and then we have criteria such as biodiversity where we measure the number of species and the more the better kind of. But then as soon as you start to challenge a bit the definitions of what are species, what are these boundaries between species and stuff, then you realize that biodiversity as such is, you know, why is it good per se? Um, and so that's something that has been kind of challenging my own perception of what we should strive for in, in ecology and conservation, for instance. So I'm, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I don't have super well developed thoughts um, because some some of this is is new to me. Um, but yeah, I can say just a couple of things. Um, so yeah, species is definitely that that could have been on the list of binaries. Um, well, yeah. not binaries, but but things that are perceived as constructed. So um, I think Timothy Morton and, and some other people. Um, uh, there's someone 
uh, Greta Lafleur, I think is her name. And um, yeah, just sort of writes about how species, these are constructs, right? And, and, and you know, I don't know enough about how it works, you know, a lot more than, than I do, but um, that some of these choices are arbitrary and they change, right? So like, Exactly. Yeah, we used to think these were like two different species. Now we think there's one or vice versa. Again, I don't know <laughs> exactly how it works, but um, yeah. So these things that, that we think of as, um, as again, sort of natural or, or possibly constructed. So that's, to me, that's an interesting um, conversation. And also sort of like what is being, um, who is benefiting from naming a certain, I don't mean literally naming, but you know, what, what, what is um, being serviced by declaring a new species or, um, you know, combining or yeah. separating these. Um, so yeah, Actually, I think someone can put their name on it, and that's the cool thing about because it is it. literally naming, yeah, and um, yeah. yeah, naming naming after men, whatever. But um, yeah. I guess I don't know that that much about like so the this movement you're saying they call themselves like anti-species, like or yeah, anti-species anti or something like that. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I thought you meant just like they're against the whole idea of <laughs> species, which would also be interesting. But um, yeah. no, it's more about like it's it's related to the vegan movement, and it's about like um, just kind of treating everybody as people regardless of the species. So I'm I'm not like really part of that, but it's just something that has challenged my own, mm -hmm. let's say, um, values or or, or stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's, and I think it relates what to what you were talking about. Um, and I think you're you're right that in in ecology, I think we have a lot of constructs that we should be questioning at least, even though even if we maybe find out that they're still good, like biodiversity might still be a useful indicator for many things. But at least we should question like why we're using that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, and I also the this idea about um, yeah again I'm still thinking through this, but the idea about trying to not interfere or inter interfering in nature, whether or not we should. I mean, I think I think a queer, the, the queer ecology community or whatever would sort of, um, they sort of come down on this idea of like, there is no pure nature anymore. There's no, you know, uh, Max, I, I never know how to say this person's last name, Liberaren, I think is how you say it, but, um, you know, says we live in a permanently polluted world. And once you sort of like, that's where we need to start from and then go from there, right? So this, these sort of fantasies of, um, restoring things or, or not interfering or, um, you know, like that ship sailed a long, a long time ago. Yeah. 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 Interesting, thank you. David? Hi, first of all, thanks for the nice, interesting talk and discussion now. Um, I think I have a bit of a common question that can maybe follows up a bit on what Anna said. Um, Coming from, a, so while I get all of these points from like the fact that we have to challenge binaries and when it comes to actually, for example, or just as an example, the concept of natural is also, I come from river sciences, uh, from management side of things. Um, and the concept of nature is something we debate a lot because you, uh, how do you find a natural river or natural system? The, the problem is at the end of the day, when we need to actually start managing things, you need to fix something. You need to quantify something, uh, which starts becoming a bit difficult when, um, when you cannot, when you always have to be aware that things cannot be binary, you shouldn't classify them, you should keep an open mind, which is super important, I think. Uh, but so my, my question to you is, I guess, uh, what would you suggest to someone? to try to keep like a, an open mind towards queerness in nature when it still comes to like actually applying, needing number, needing to define things. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> don't wanna tell you how to do your job. However, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, this, this is sort of what Anna's getting at as well, I think is just, um, like recognizing that some of these things are constructs, right? Rather than taking them for granted, thinking about who who are they serving? So um, the idea of, I don't know, um, you know, again, like decl declaring a new species so you can like give it, <laughs> give it uh, your own name or whatever, obviously that's a comical example, but um, yeah, recognizing that, that these are constructs that um, asking who they're serving. And then I think this is gonna be a really weird answer, but hear me out. Um, 
I write a lot of, of, on irony and sort of um, irony as being a valuable political position. So, um, and this is something I take from, from civil rights activism in the US that there's this sort of um, uh, belief that like the struggle, you'll never win the struggle, but you should act like you will anyway. <laughs> so it's this sort of like, you know, keep moving uh, and just have this sort of like dark sense of humor about, you know, uh, the world seems like screwed, but let's try to save it anyway, right? That you kind of have to have that sort of like weird ironic flexibility. And I guess I'd be interested in sort of like thinking about these categories as like ironic categories or like maybe a better word would be like provisional or strategic, right? Like we are calling this natural in order to serve this thing. And we've interrogated that serving and we, we still think that's a good thing and we're just gonna go with it, right? So I don't know, putting air quotes around <laughs> nature literally or figuratively. Um, but, um, yeah, you're also reminding me that I've written on transgender rivers, which is a whole other story, and we can talk about that in a few moments, but, um, yeah, and, I mean, I come from a non, uh, I come from a qualitative field, not a quantitative field, so this is not something that I have to deal with, but, um, but yeah, I think, um, sort of interrogating the history of science and clearly the history of science has been, you know, racist, homophobic, you know, masculinist, uh, fill in the blank. And um, if we are still using these categories like natural, are they still serving those masters or are they serving some other master? So that's my sort of philosophical answer to your very uh, logistical question. So. And I think uh, I will speak here for many of us if I say transgender rivers. <laughs> yeah, I want the plastic thing. <laughs> Please. I mean, rivers Please are transgender by nature because they have uh, usually not a clear path they change. <laughs> so I'm going to see, I've never tried to do the file attachment thing here, and I'm going to see if it works and I can give you an essay, but if not, I will, I will send it to Jens and maybe he can pass it on. But um, so I... I started out this essay where, ooh, is this it? I think this is it. This may work. We're going to see. Um, sorry, trying to talk and click things at the same time. Um, so, um, nope, that's not going to work. Okay, just kidding. Where are you guys? Um, okay, I'm going to have to send it by email. Um, so I started out this essay, I really wanted to write about Edward Abbey, which I don't know if people are familiar with him, but he's, um, he's an American um, writer and um, environmentalist and was really against the damming of the Colorado River. And um, he was also like super offensive, and, like pretty homophobic, pretty transphobic. And he has this description of the Colorado River where he talks about like how beautiful it is that it's changing all the time and you know, change is natural. And then he makes this really um, creepy reference to, um, like he opposes the river to um, culture, which he says is like, he uses this phrase like um, transactional, transvestite, uh, something uh, modern culture, right? Civilization. So he's um, sort of setting up this binary where like change is okay in nature. Like it's okay for a river to change, but it's not okay for like a human being to change sex, right? So he makes this clear like nature versus culture division and, and sort of there's a good kind of changeability and there's a bad kind of changeability. Um, and then I also write about, um, um, there's, now I'm forgetting her name, um, the geologist, not Catherine Youssef, but the other one whose name I'm forgetting. Um, she writes about this river um, in indigenous country in, um, in Australia and how the, the story that the, the Aboriginal people have of this river is that the river is transgender. So it, it used to be a girl and um, it was um, threatened with sexual assault by, this is sort of like, you know, back, back in the day, it, it was a girl and it was threatened by sexual assault and it, it um, laid down and hid from like a, a group of men or something that was um, trying, to, trying to attack. And so the girl laid down and the girl became a river. And the girl, oh, sorry, and the girl dressed as a boy. That was very important, sorry. The girl dressed as a boy to avoid sexual assault and then laid down and became a river. And so then they talk about, the Aboriginal people talk about this river as transgender, right? As being male and female or whatever. Um, and so I just, I kind of do like a reading of those, those two things together and basically sort of saying like they're, there are, um, these are also like not new ideas. This is an important thing to say, right? Queer ecologies is, you can find queer ecologies in indigenous cultures. And um, and that's another thing we could talk about as well, right? That that it's not, um, 
that sort of the colonial imposition of normative gender has had like <laughs> effects not just on humans and their ability to express their gender, but also on you know how nature is treated, right? So these ideas of binary gender are kind of connected to um, uh, to environmental destruction. We could we could argue, but um, yeah, yeah. Transgender rivers. <laughs> I will send it. I'm so sad. I really thought you could attach files and then it like started closing windows and I was afraid I was going to lose you guys. So. Nicole, have you read The Left Hand of Darkness the, from Ursula Lewin? I have, but not since like grad school. So like 10 years. Okay. So yeah. I just have a question concerning that book, but it's too far away. Uh, are these, is the, are those two articles that you, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Are those two articles that you just referred to that you wrote, were they academic ones or were they like? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Can you please link those? Yeah. Somehow? Or yeah. just send like a. Yeah, let me. Document let me... TNs that I can distribute after. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I was hoping I could find a. So the, the one I just mentioned is in um, the Cambridge Companion to Queer Studies. And let me just see if I can get a link to the book. I can't. Kind of a scary story, the second one you talked about. Oh, yeah. No, it's, yeah. It's interesting. Ooh. Can you get it? For, no. Okay. There's a link to the essay, but like I said, I'll have to email the actual document. But, yeah. Cool. Are there any more comments, uh, questions, uh, strange accusations, whatever? Seems people are thinking or or not. Or <laughs> uh, Sabrina? Yeah, probably. I, I would like to refer w uh, to what uh, David uh, said that uh, because I have started as a cultural scientist with a social ecology background and some ecofeminism, and I've ended up somehow as an environmentalist with uh, focus on rivers and of course I also have to do a lot with uh, yeah with engineering and uh, planning and all these formal stuff and uh, also struggle with uh, yes yeah, somehow uh, yeah trying to to um, get not too biased by how things work outside there and and i think it's um a one one thing is uh this, despite of course uh, being aware that you are um thinking in and categories that are somehow not only artificial but also harmful often uh, is also to try to integrate uh, different for, for example different categories of knowledge and I think we we have already some uh, some of that um, yeah some instruments like um, for example citizen science mm -hmm. so where where you have the the uh, citizen as an expert and the expert knowledge that stands side by side with the knowledge of an engineer for example and we have these these uh, bridging concepts like nature based solutions where we don't have the in my case typical German engineer that is controlling nature and that uh, and, and who can can uh, yeah, figure out everything in, in numbers but where we have these um, incredible possibilities and of, of nature restoring itself and uh, the the uh, engineer that has to do a step back and let the river do its work because we are working with uh, biological ways of engineering today and and of course you can do everything of that in a, a harmful way where you put old things in in new uh, shoes and uh, yeah somehow end up with something where you think you have started there 10 years before but you can also try to uh, yeah, hide probably new new ideas of of uh, yeah more more um, how to say um, more diverse concepts and uh, and try to um, translate them into um, into a language that is known by the people you have to negotiate with, but have another framework in mind. 
and then uh, if, if you if you deal with uh, it, with the concepts uh, in in a yeah like like languages and uh, and you handle these languages with care because we we all know that language have power as well so to shape things but if you do so then I think you can be on the one hand understandable and on the on the other hand a little bit re revolutionaries <laughs> just as a thought or comment yeah no that's brilliant and these these i don't know it's funny i was just talking to um a radio reporter right before we had this conversation and i just sort of forgot like what zoom i was like on you know <laughs> it's just like i forget like the things that people like i'm afraid that i'm always either like saying something incredibly obvious because we all share the same foundation or I'm saying something that's like so like I've skipped three steps you know and so it's like hard to remember especially when you do interdisciplinary stuff it's just like who am I talking to again what's the the, the bottom line so yeah no I think that's a really beautiful um um observation so yeah thank you are there any other questions Cara I just have a comment I listened to Jens's podcast with you um, and I really found the comment about how our infrastructures um, reinforce our ideas about genders being opposites. Um, and I found this actually like a really fascinating uh, a theory that I've never actually dived into. So um, I really appreciated that. <laughs> if you have any other like on the top of your head examples of actually how our infrastructure really informs that. I think that was like a really also clear example that you can really easily sort of tell people that don't have this background or have never sort of exercised these ideas, giving them those sort of clear examples mm -hmm. is really useful. Yeah, so just for if anyone didn't hear it, um, I was talking about, it's, this is, um, I just was plagiarizing my student, although I, I, I said that I was, uh, so it's okay. Um, you know, I had a student that wrote um, an essay about, um, this was in a queer theory class about how all the bathrooms in our university campus, the male and female, not only are there male and female bathrooms, right, but they are on the opposite side of every floor of every building, right? So they would never be next to each other. So I would always try to find a bathroom and it's like, that's the men's bathroom. Okay, I guess it's <laughs> the one I want is on the complete opposite side of this building, right? Which is sort of, uh, again, uh, suggesting this fantasy of complete opposite genders. But um, yeah, another example, um, so I talk about the High Line as being this sort of transgender landscape architecture where it's like curving and um, you know it's it's not going in a straight line, right? Um, other examples, um, Kate Sandylands, who's um, I think I think I cited her at some point. She wrote a, a collection called Queer Ecologies, which was um, ten years ago and sort of like a big landmark um, publication. And she talks about um, campsites in the U.S. and Canada and how they were. Um, designed to be um, sort of like suburban cul-de-sacs so that you would like pull, you know, pull your station wagon just into this little slot and then you'd have your campsite and um, how they were arranged in these um, ways that seems like, you know, you're, you're out to see nature, but it's actually sort of reinforcing these um, sort of like suburban nuclear family norms where it's like uh, you're located in a way that's like um, you have privacy, right? So no one would like see you like pee in the woods because that would be terrible if anyone like, saw a naked body and, you know, very family friendly and, um, but that you would never like see another family, right? So like families don't mix because they're their own like little unit or whatever. Um, I feel like she has something more about gender, but um, now I'm forgetting it. But um, yeah, I'm trying to think of other examples. Um, I mean, I'm sure people have written about um, you know, like kitchen design or you know, like that sort of thing. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you for that example and for that podcast. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to you guys Ka coming up Ka with this. Cara did the, actually the <laughs> opening of the podcast. It's what, oh, what's her voice. <laughs> yeah, so I listened to it very carefully. <laughs> oh, so you listened to it and then you did the, the intro. Uh, I can't remember in which order, but I definitely lo listened to it thoroughly. And then again, no it was a great intro i was sort of like oh you don't even need to listen to like you know me talk about career ecology it's already like in that, in that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, that. I just, I just so 
that will, that will we will publish that in uh, the scene in the woods uh, Rachel Carson Center blog post in uh, one month so yeah th uh, we are approaching the end and you have also your your meeting with uh, Christoph and Nicole I do yeah. there's no so, there's no more office hours left for him before I left town so I was like ah oh, we have to do but <laughs> Thanks a lot for, for the chat and the conversation. I think it was really interesting. And for sure, uh, we have some thoughts uh, that are left to, to be thought in the coming days. I have many interesting ideas that I want to keep thinking about. Um, uh, I thank you all for being here. I thank you, Nicole, for also uh, presenting and uh, being here able to, to discuss about all these concepts. And I invite you all to check out the coming uh, science chats that are uh, going to be like, uh, we have in one science chat and then a movie night. So for you, those of you who, who already know that, uh, cool. For those of you who do not, you are welcome to join us. Uh, well, thank you all. I think we are approaching the end. Um, so I just wanted to ask uh, David, Eli, or Cara, or Simra if I forgot something. If we had to give any other like notice, like Nachricht. Okay, perfect. So thank you all. Thank you. That's it. Great, great um, challenging, important questions and comments. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Yeah, it's always challenging to do this interdisciplinary stuff, like you said. But that's that's, that's awesome. a cool stuff about this. Okay. Thank you all. Take care and good night. Good time. Bye. Mmm.